Now, hello and welcome to episode 113 of Chairside Live. We got a good show for you today. We've got a nice interview with my good friend and fellow lecturer, Dr. Gary Rads. Gary practices in uh, Denver, Colorado, is a member of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. Uh, and frankly, one of the people who I look up to when it comes to aesthetics, he's somebody uh, who has really gotten into minimal prep veneers, even no prep veneers, and really focused even on um, cosmetic dentistry for adolescents. And it's not by using veneers, it's doing other things to kind of help younger adults be able to improve their smiles as well. He lectures all around the country and is also the um, inventor or helped develop, I should say, one of my favorite products uh, of all time, and that is uh, Luxacor Z. Love that build-up material. If you like it too, you have Gary to thank, and I think we will talk about that a little bit when I get a chance to speak with him. But before that, let's go to the case of the week. And one of the things that we see here in the lab that is often a challenge for us is when we have a Kennedy class one or class two situation. So we're either missing all the posterior teeth bilaterally or unilaterally. And in cases like those, when dentists go to take a bite, uh, things can be, be very difficult, especially if we just get a little bite registration of the six anterior teeth against the upper anterior teeth. As you might imagine, the posterior parts of the models will be floating in space and vertically the bite's gonna be off anywhere from uh, two millimeters to 10 millimeters to half a millimeter to we guessed just right and got it right on, but probably not going to be correct. So uh, today we're gonna look at an implant case that actually came into the laboratory and see what we sent back to the dentist and give them an easier way to be able to take a really accurate bite. So when the dentist goes to actually seat all these restorations, hopefully there will be no adjustments necessary or just very few adjustments, not something where the dentist is gonna be banging his head against a wall because he's got a grind on ceramic material for the next 20 minutes. So let's go ahead and take a look at the case of the week. In this week's case of the week, we're gonna talk about a common issue that we see in our implant department, and it relates mainly to Kennedy class one and class two cases. If you forgot the Kennedy classifications, that's certainly understandable. A class one is where we have uh, bilateral edentulous space and a Kennedy class two is where we just have, for example, a unilateral edentulous space as if we still had teeth over on this side. And in both of these cases, and this is true for crown and bridge, regular crown and bridge cases, but certainly for the implant cases as we look at this, you can see we just have a lack of posterior support because we're missing all of the posterior teeth. And when it comes time to take a bite registration for this, some dentists will just inject material between the remaining anterior teeth. Some dentists will inject material back here onto the edentulous ridge and against the teeth. And either way, we end up with a much higher remake rate than we should have because we really don't have a good way to take a nice, stable bite registration. We run into this problem in removable as well. And fortunately, with implants, we can do things a little bit differently. So let's take a look at how we're going to use a positioning and bite index to solve this problem. Here are a couple of pictures of what happens in the laboratory when we don't have an accurate bite registration. These are uh, both cases where the doctor tried in the restorations and you can see uh, that the bite was way off in the posterior. We were completely edentulous like a Kennedy class one or two case would be. And then the doctor sat it in the mouth and this is what it looked like. And then he took a new bite and sent it back to us. What I'm gonna share with you today is a way to avoid this so that you don't have to go through this remake scenario. And we give ourselves the best chance of having the bite either be right on or needing very minimal adjustments when we go to seat the case. So let's look at a patient who's had five implants placed here in a bilateral edentulous area. And now we're gonna go ahead and take our impression. So we're gonna put the transfer copings into place, uh, into uh, the implants, and of course you're gonna wanna take an x-ray, a digital x-ray hopefully, to verify that these copings have seated all the way onto the implant. And then we're gonna take our implant uh, level impression. We can do this with a closed tray method or an open tray, it really doesn't matter. But we wanna make sure that that transfer coping is completely seated uh, on the implant, and then we're gonna take that impression and send the copings in the impression uh, to the laboratory. And in a case like this, I'm a big fan of custom abutments, especially on, say, on this side here where we're doing a bridge. Uh, I just don't think there's any way uh, to beat custom abutments when we're going to have a bridge in terms of draw, in terms of support structure for the bridge itself. I think this is just a great use 
uh, for custom abutments. So the laboratory has now sent us back a couple of cust custom abutments along with our positioning byte index. So let's take a look at how we're going to use this. This is the positioning and byte index as it comes back from the laboratory. It's you know easily marked so you can see uh, where number 18 and number 20 are. And so we're going to use this to do two things. We're going to use this to position the custom abutments in the mouth uh, and to verify and or take a new byte registration uh, in a really sturdy manner that's going to give a very accurate byte relationship to the laboratory so that we minimize our chances of having to make a lot of adjustments at the seat appointment. So the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and position the custom abutments into the positioning index. Little black dot there on the buckle. I'm going to go right into the positioning index and then I'm just going to hold that in place with a little flowable composite just because it's a lower and we don't want it to fall out. And just cure that for a few seconds obviously without any bonding agent or anything. And then we'll take the custom abutment for number 20 and seat it in place. And again, just use a little dab of flowable composite. And we're going to use this to make sure that we've got the orientation correct of the custom abutments in the mouth. So a nice little seating index here. So now we'll take the index, and not only should the two custom abutments fit into the soft tissue spots, but you can see when viewed from the occlusal that it also has an index on the adjacent natural tooth. So at this point, we'll drop the two screws in to the custom abutments, and then begin to tighten the screws down. And I can fill the distal part of the positioning index seating as the screws tighten down as it falls into place. Again with the custom abutments being held so that they really can't rotate. Just going back and forth and making sure that they are tight. And then I verify occlusally that we're in good solid contact with the cuspid in this case. So at this point I can take my little index off and just flick off the two little pieces of flowable composite that kept it from falling out of the splint. Verify that the screws are in fact tightened, even though we already knew that they were. And just visually verify that they appear to be down. And in this case, we're going to snap another radiograph. Always got to make sure that we get, and this is one of the great reasons to have digital radiography, is to be able to take a quick picture and just make sure that these uh, implant components are in fact seated all the way. A lot of times we're dealing with stuff where it might be three, four, five millimeter subgingival and visually you just can't check and you also can't assume that because the screw stopped turning that everything is seated all the way and so digital radiographs are a fantastic way to verify that we're seated all the way because if we're not we're going to have problems with occlusion down the road, we're going to have problems with the draw uh, of the bridge. So uh, assuming this was a patient we would take a radiograph and in fact verify that they were down all the way. And now we're going to put our index back in place. Now typically when you get this back from the laboratory, what we're going to send to you is going to have uh, the occlusal surfaces of the opposing teeth already in place here in this hard acrylic. So when you put this into place, the first thing you're going to have the patient do is bite together and verify and see if you happen to get the bite right. If everything happens to be mounted correctly when they bite together, it'll fit into the tooth indentations on the bite index. But the chances realistically of this happening are probably only about 5%. I would say 90, 95% of the time when the patient bites together into this index, they're not gonna close smoothly right into it. And that's the whole point of this appointment is to get a more accurate bite registration. So at that point, we take the index out and do what I've already done here with a watermelon burr and that is grind away all the occlusal anatomy that was already there. What we want to do is assure that the patient is now freely biting together and closing and you can see all the space that we have here between the opposing teeth and uh, the guide itself. In fact, there, there's no contact at all. We want them to freely be able to close. In fact, we want to mark these anterior teeth with articulating paper ahead of time to see what maximum intercuspation looks like and then we want to make sure and verify that that is still happening now when the patient bites together. I'm going to go ahead and repeat those same steps for the other side now. 
And now we'll go ahead and place the guide on the other side with the custom abutments in place and then begin to tighten those screws down. And now we have the other side uh, tightened down as well. In fact, you can see as I try to rock this that there's there's really just no movement at all. It's sitting down on top of the custom abutments and it's also grasping onto the adjacent natural teeth and it just won't move at all. When you compare this to a typical bite block that we use in removable uh, or even a crown and bridge just trying to take a, an, a bite registration of an edentulous space, a mush bite as it's sometimes called. This is just a huge jump ahead, light years ahead in terms of accuracy. And you can see why we're hopefully going to need very few adjustments when we go to finally put the case in place because we've got this nice stiff platform that we're going to use for our bite registration. And again, when the patient bites together, I've already ground that so that there's no contact at all between the opposing teeth and that bite plane itself. Like I mentioned, when it comes back from the laboratory, it's got indentations from those opposing teeth, and there's a chance that it might be right on, but there's probably a better chance that it's not quite right on. And if it's not quite right on, just grind all that material away so you can see daylight between the opposing teeth and the bite registration itself. Again, make sure that these anterior teeth are contacting in their proper positions uh, with the two bite indexes in place so that the patient is coming together the right way now because in just a minute, we're going to flow our bite registration material in there. So again, it's a great use with in conjunction with the custom abutments. Now, if you were using stock abutments here, uh, you wouldn't have something like this. You could fabricate it in your office and make something like this that would attach onto the stock abutments and take the bite the same way if you're willing to go through that. And if you do, that's fine. And, and you're going to save yourself a lot of time at the seat appointment. Uh, in adjustments if you do this type of bite registration. I just find it to be easier to do it in conjunction uh, with the custom abutments and be able to get this bite. So let's go ahead now that we've got this free and the patient can close down all the way without any interference and we've got our stable platform, let's go ahead and do our bite registration. Any polyvinyl siloxane bite registration material happens to stick uh, very well uh, to the light cured guide itself. So there's no uh, reason to put any kind of uh, bonding agent here. This is going to stick to it. Uh, in fact, it hardly, it's very difficult to get it off if you ever wanted to get it off. If you wanted to take it off in your office and do the bite for a second time, you'll see you need to get a scalpel out and really go through a little bit of work to do this. And then you guide the patient into closing. And again, you should be able to visually verify that those anterior teeth are touching in maximum intercuspation. And once the polyvinyl bite registration material has fully set, you'll be able to have the patient open and close. You can trim away any excess before you do that and be able to verify that the patient can in fact open and close. So we'll let this set for 60 seconds and then we'll verify that. So here's our bite registration. It's now in two pieces because this patient has stone teeth instead of uh, wet enamel. So it's stuck a little more, but you can see how accurate this is. It's actually kind of a nice thing that it's in two pieces because as we put these sections back and seat it back onto the custom abutments, you can see how perfectly it fits together. I mean, the, the tolerances here are fantastic. It sits right back onto those custom abutments. And this is just as solid as it gets. This is as good as a bite registration is going to get. And I'd like to be able to duplicate this for removable uh, as well as implant dentistry. And now when the patient closes back into this, they close right down into it and we're able to verify this. And so at this point, all we have to do is remove the segments and we're going to remove the custom abutments and send this all back uh, to the laboratory. In fact, we've recently started a new program here where we actually can do duplicate abutments. So when you remove the custom abutments and send it back to the laboratory now for a, uh, a small charge, I think it's $59 a, a unit, we will actually send you duplicate uh, abutments for these custom abutments, which will allow you to put those into place and will also send a biotemps bridge along with it in case you want to uh, do a fixed provisional solution uh, at this point. So we can send you duplicate abutments and then you'll have a biotemp bridge that you can cement on top of that. You'll have a small occlusal adjustment probably to make on that biotemps bridge, just the same way that we had to grind some of the anatomy off the bite index before we did the bite registration. But that's another way to be able to uh, provisionalize this patient with something fixed like a biotemp through the use of these duplicate abutments. 
So again, with the use of this positioning byte index in conjunction with some custom abutments, we're able to really solve one of the big problems that we see here in the laboratory, and that is to be able to accurately dial in the occlusion on a Kennedy class one or a Kennedy class two uh, clinical situation where we've lost uh, the uh, we've lost all the posterior teeth on either one or both sides. And again, if you don't use um, uh, custom abutments and you're doing this with a solid abutment or a stock abutment, an abutment replica or what we sometimes in the lab call a single stage abutment, you can still do something like this. You'll just need to fashion a jig like this uh, in your office to be able to get a stable platform here to put some bite registration on the other side and have the patient uh, closed down into. But again, I'm not saying this because I'm at the laboratory, but I just like custom abutments because I want my laboratory technicians designing abutments with the ideal amount of draw, with the uh, ideal taper, and the ideal amount of support for whatever permanent bridge, like a Bruxer bridge, is going to go in a spot like this. That's really one of the reasons why I prefer to use the custom abutments rather than using a stock abutment and prepping it myself in the mouth and then trying to accurately communicate uh, where those abutments are going to be uh, to the laboratory. So I'm a big fan of the custom abutments and now that we're able to use this positioning bite index to be able to get a very accurate bite back to the laboratory, uh, we can really minimize uh, any adjustments we might have to make at the seat appointment. Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Latola, the Director of Clinical Education here at Glidewell Laboratories. And as part of our ongoing Chairside Live Clinician Interview Series, I'm happy to be here today with my good friend, Dr. Gary Radz, who practices in uh, Denver, Colorado. And I've known Gary for a long time, probably over a decade, maybe almost two decades, probably more than either one of us uh, want to admit. Gary, how are you doing today? Doing well, Mike. Thanks for having me. And how are things going uh, in the dental world in, uh, in and about Colorado? Have, uh, have you seen a, a recovery from uh, the recession of 2008, 2009, and maybe part of 2010? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely bouncing back. Um, uh, fortunately, I don't think Colorado got hit as bad as a lot of other places, but, you know, we saw a dip like everybody else. But, um, yeah, last year we were pretty much up to uh, our 2008 numbers, 2007 numbers, so, um, you know, we feel like we made it back. Very good, and uh, if you were to kind of characterize your practice, I mean, I, I know you from uh, just being around uh, aesthetic academies and other things we've done. I know certainly you've always focused on uh, on aesthetic dentistry, but if you had to break it down, what, what percent would you say uh, of what you guys do on a monthly basis is aesthetic versus kind of the bread and butter stuff that most dentists um, do? Yeah, I'd say we're like 40% is, you know, the purely elective cosmetic cases. And, but there's still a majority of the practice is still general dentistry, one, two crowns at a time, a few fillings, and cleaning teeth, making people happy. <laughs> exactly. And when you say crowns, you know, one, one or two at a time, um, that's exactly the breakdown that we see here at Glidewell. You know, we get probably... Last month, we probably did maybe 110,000 crowns in a month. I mean, an unbelievable volume. But when you look at that, 79% um, of those crowns were just single-unit crowns, and then another you know, 11% were two crowns. And so you look at basically 90%, and we're, of course, as the biggest lab in the country, 90% of the dentistry coming in is being done one or two units uh, at a time. And so you're actually, you know, you've hit the nail right on the head. We can tell that's pretty much how, how dentistry gets done. I remember when I graduated from LVI in 1995, I thought I was going to go back to my practice and everything was going to be 8 and 10 unit and 12 unit veneer cases, but that that's not the reality, is it? No, no, unfortunately, uh, insurance still dictates a lot of treatment for patients no matter how you try to educate them. Um, the reality is there's some people that that's all they can afford to do, that's all they want to do. Um, or, you know, that for a lot of people, that's all they need. I mean, a lot of young people really don't have a lot of broken down teeth that, you know, got one that got away from them, needed a root canal. That one gets the crown. So, you know, it, it's in part the reality and in, you know, it's in part what insurance is making patients dictate for their treatment. Have you ventured into uh, other areas of aesthetics for those younger patients who don't necessarily have a lot that needs to be done or don't necessarily 
neat veneers because they had uh, ortho and bleaching. Are you doing uh, any type of ortho, whether it's traditional or yeah. whether it's with aligners? Or yeah, we've uh, we've expanded our orthodontic services to the point where a couple of years ago I hired a, an ortho assistant um, because you do see that the younger people uh, they don't need veneers; they've already bleached their teeth, uh, but a lot of them want to straighten their teeth. So the Invisaligns and the, the short-term orthodontics and removable aligners. Uh, we're, we're doing a fair amount of that, and there's, uh, you know, there's a nice steady clientele that want that. And for me, it's still fun. It keeps me in that cosmetic, elective dentistry end that I enjoy doing. So, uh, yeah, I've spent a lot of time not only in the practice, but my time outside the practice uh, in my personal continuing education and, and doing some orthodontics. I know that you've actually done some work with uh, with dental companies, and you've helped to. Uh, innovate some of the materials that uh, that I really like. Tell me a little bit about your involvement, how you got started with that and wanting to come up with you know a different type of product and uh, because I think a lot of dentists have that idea but they aren't necessarily sure how to go about something like that. Yeah. Well, a lot of the things like again you and I see from the, the speaking and writing we do, we get involved with companies because they want us to see stuff first. And in my early career um, I worked with Dr. Ross Nash who I know you know and uh, Ross was uh, getting a lot of materials from companies. So one of my jobs when I worked with him was staying on top of the product reviews and turning stuff in and um, you know, sitting next to him in the operatory and writing down different thoughts we had on different uh, products. So that's kind of how I got into it. And you know, some products would be more interesting than others. And I'd call company presidents or product managers and ask more questions to learn more about it. Um, but that's where I learned how I could start to have some input on, on doing that. Um, so you know, there, there's several different products I kind of like to look at and say, yeah, I had a kind of a big fingerprint on how those came to be. Um, so it's fun. I mean, it just keeps the clinical dentistry interesting. You know, so you're always thinking. You're not just you know plugging a hole and turning a burr. Um, but you look at your patients differently and your procedures different. It's like, how can we do this better? And do I know somebody in a company that can help me, you know, make a new product or create a different burr or, you know, those sort of things? It just makes the clinical practice more fun. Yeah, and I think when you look at dental products that are out there, a lot of the really uh, great products did have um, a dentist behind it, a dentist kind of helping to innovate it or push it along. I mean, you, you look at Dan Fisher and what he's done. Uh, at Ultradent, and there's just a lot of smaller uh, examples too. But you know, one of the things when I look around at the preps and impressions that we see here at the lab, and again, we probably get you know do about 110,000 maybe crowns a month. And if I had to look at those and give you an estimate, I, I would say probably less than 10 percent, certainly less than 15 percent, have had a buildup done. And I know you were instrumental. In helping um, DMG come up with their their buildup material, Luxacore. This is a material that I used before I even knew you had anything to do with it, and continue to use. Yeah. And I'm always looking for a way to try to get dentists to wrap their heads around uh, doing buildups more often, so that the preps we see are more pristine and they mill better, whether it's Emacs or Brux or things like yeah. that. So. Before you tell me about you know your involvement with with Lexicor and how you got started and helped them develop that, why do you think it's so difficult to get dentists to place buildups? I think it's time, just pure and simple. You're you got a busy schedule. You know we all we're not getting reimbursed the same and, and by the insurance companies. So you've got instead of two chairs going, you might have three. You know so we're running behind schedule and to take you know the extra. You know, 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever it's going to take to do the buildup. I think a lot of dentists just look at it and say, I don't have time to do this. I'm already behind. Um, and it, as we can get to a second, in a second on, on LuxCore and other similar products, um, buildups don't have to take that long. And, and there's ways to do that. But I, th I think, unfortunately, they just they feel like they're in a time crunch and they can't take the time to do it. Um, but what they miss, they miss two things. One, a buildup's a legitimate restorative procedure that you can get reimbursed for. I mean, plus or minus, you know, I get reimbursed two hundred fifty to three hundred dollars for one, and I can knock one out in four to six minutes. So they're leaving money on the table. 
Okay, so that's one. But the other thing is, and you touched on it when you started to ask a question, when you talk about milling, so many of our impressions now are sent in the lab, and the lab scans the impression and mills that scan. Well, if you don't have an ideal scan, when you're trying to do zirconia, you're trying to do Emax, and your prep looks like this, you're not going to get a good scan. So you're going to lose time on the backside because your crown's not going to fit. Because you're asking the computer to read this jagged moon surface, you know, god awful prep. I mean, you see, you know what I'm talking about, you see it every day. Um, the quality of the final restoration just isn't going to be there if you don't have a great prep. And if you don't build the tooth up correctly, on a, you know, a tooth that's been damaged, decayed, you're never going to have a good prep. You know, we got spoiled, you know, in the early days because PFMs, you know, you're waxing a metal coping and you can make it fit just about anywhere. But, you know, scanning requires and milling requires that we, as dentists, provide the labs with much better preps than what we're doing. And buildups are a huge part of that. I don't know if you remember this article, but there was an article that Bill Strupp did years ago, and it was called the Top 22 Reasons to Do Buildups. I think it was in, like, Dentistry Today. And I liked that it was the top 22. Like, he shortened the list down from 50. He decided that, you know, that brevity was the soul of wit. And so he pulled it from 50 to 22. And I used to show it in my lectures. And I say, here's what Bill Streff has to say about Bill. And by the time we got to, like, 14 or 15, you could see people, you know, nodding off in the audience. And uh, But it's true. And, and a couple of the big ones were, you know, insulating the pulp. You know, it just, just not having a patient come in for a crown. And uh, you put the temporary on, and then you put the permanent one on, and now it needs to end to a week later. And in the patient, you know, you ask the patient, when did it start to hurt? And they say, the second you put the crown on. You go, yes, but that's, I'm pretty sure that's a coincidence. Um, what else? You've been in a car accident recently? And it's like, no, I'm pretty sure it's when you put the crown on. And it was just such an insult, you know, because you didn't base it up before you put the leaky temporary on for two weeks right. that you, you really would have got some insulation there as well. So... How did, um, how did you get involved um, with DMG and develop uh, Luxacor? Oh, yeah, that, that was fun. It was, was uh, stumbled on it. I was uh, always interested in, in buildups, you know, some weird dentist. Um, but in my school in North Carolina, that was drilled into our heads. We had to do buildups before we did any crowns. You know, you know, we're so old, you know, we're doing them in amalgam. So you do the buildup, they go away for 40 hours, they come back. And so I was always looking for a different way. And when I got out of school, uh, you, I'm sure you remember Tycor. Tycor and Corpace were out right about the, right, the same time. Um, you know, so I'm dating myself. We're going back 20 years. But as soon as I went into private practice, I jumped on that. And I started using that stuff. And it was cumbersome, but it was better than amalgam because I could prep the same day. Exactly. And I'm a young associate, and I need the money, so I wanted to prep the same day. Um, so where I stumbled on this is... Ross and I were evaluating Luxatemp way, way back when it first came out. And that was totally new. You know, before that, we were doing powder and liquid and, and creating temporaries that way. So when I had turned in the evaluation on the Luxatemp, I called the company president at the time, Larry Katz. I'm, not, I'm sure you remember Larry. And I asked Larry, I said, Larry, could you do this with core material? Because Zenith then, DMG, had... Like core paste, it was in the tubs. But I said, Larry, can you take that? Because it was a good material at the time. I said, can you take that and make it like Luxatem? Because that would make my life easier, too. So with that, Larry communicated with um, the Germans, uh, the DMG uh, home office in Germany. And I spent the next three years going back and forth with uh, the chemist in Hamburg, just, you know, I need this, I need this. All the way country, this way country. No, we need this. And um, it was really fun just to, that's really the first time I went through the front door and beginning to end really helped develop a product. I mean, I was never mixing the test tubes, but I'd tell them what I'd want. They'd ship it to me. I'd try it, you know, on models from the laptop. And it was fascinating to go through, interesting to see the thought process that goes on their end and how long it takes, you know, what I thought was a really good idea to end up in a box on a shelf and like show up. And it, it literally took a bit of two or three to three and a half years. And from what I know of German companies, three to three and a half years is breakneck speed. 
That's uh, they would have rather had 10 to 13 years. <laughs> have part two of that for you in a future episode of Chairside Live. Well, that about wraps it up for this edition. On behalf of myself, the CSL crew, and everybody here at the lab, I want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry. Hey now, hello and welcome to episode 113 of Chairside Live. Today we've got a nice inner four. <laughs> <laughs> Hey now, hello and welcome to episode 113 of Chairside Live. We've got a nice interview. You and that's how you do CSL in eight minutes. <laughs>